right, welcome to our next seminar series. Today we have Peter Shade. Did I say it right? You did. Yes, right, good. He is a, an engineer and he works for the deputy director. He is the deputy director of design and construction division for the Ventura County Watershed Protection District. That is a mouthful, but it sounds like a great job. So you have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from San Diego State University and a Master's of Science also in Civil Engineering from Colorado State Engineering, or sorry, Colorado State University. Don's from Colorado also. So hey, you're cool. yes. right. Yes. Uh, with <laughs> in open channel hydraulics and river mechanics. Peter has almost 30 years of water resources engineering experience. I know a lot of you are interested in water resources engineering, so Peter is your guy to talk to. Um, with 16 years at the district, and he has worked on the Matillaha Dam project since 2004. So he has a lot of great information that he's gonna share with us today. Oh, there you go. Thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know how many engineers you haven't come and talked to you here, but um, uh, we all work on multidisciplinary teams these days. So, so whatever you guys are focused on, it's likely that you're going to be working with engineers and other disciplines with whatever jobs that you um, get into. So. Uh, so hopefully what I'm saying to you makes sense and uh, and uh, like I said you'll be working with us um, in the future uh, my boss actually told me some engineering jokes you guys want to hear yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, do you, what what is an what is an extrovert engineer he looks at your shoes instead of his own <laughs> <laughs> how, how does an engineer or what what is an engineer use for birth control his, his own personality. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I think self-deprecating self is pretty common, so we can understand that. And in the line of jokes, um, what did the fish say when he hit a <laughs> um, That's a really old joke. It's been repackaged into a meme. So hopefully some of you that are uh, still in your early 20s uh, haven't seen that before. So uh, the Tillaha Dam. The Tillaha Dam. It's in the Ventura River watershed uh, between uh, north of Ojai, uh, upstream of Ventura. And uh, so um, I'll be talking about a project that's been going on for quite a while. And I'll start at the beginning, talk about what it looked like a little bit before the dam was there and then during the dam construction, what's happened over the last uh, you know, 50 plus years, and then more recently, efforts to remove the dam. So this is what it looked like about where the dam is now before the dam was in. So you can see that it had a lot of great natural resources, a lot of habitat for fish and other wildlife, and uh, and, and there actually looked like there were people that were that were habitating in the reservoir area as well. Um, here's some pictures uh, of uh, some of the resources that were were pulled out of the river. Uh, a lot of steelhead where it used to be in the river before the dam was there. And uh, this one always makes me laugh. I don't know when this was taken. These like guys look like Amish almost. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know how long ago that was taken, but I guess that was the, the dress at the time that this was taken. This is an area called Hanging Rock. Um, I should say that some of these slides are from Paul Jenkins. Paul Jenkins uh, is with Surfrider, and he and I uh, gave a presentation that Kiki heard and that's how I got the invitation, but Paul wasn't available tonight. So, so some of these slides are Paul's. Um, Paul has a dream that when the dam comes out, he'll be able to jump off hanging rock in the mm -hmm. water. Nobody really knows if it was st still there under the sediment or if it was uh, demolished during the dam removal, but, um, but you know, this was really a place that people like to come to and recreate, and they had a lot of great resources. Um, cooling off in the summer, of course, I'm sure it was hot there, just like it is <laughs> hot there now, back, back before the dam was there. So the dam was constructed in 1947, uh, estimated cost of about $4 million, and uh, these are uh, just a, a copy of one of the plan sheets that was used to, to build it. It took less than a year to build. And here's some photos, it's, uh, I, I love this. All the men are always wearing hats in some of these old photos. <laughs> and uh, equipment doesn't look the same, a lot of shovels, so there's a lot of hard labor involved. And that this is actually a photo 
This is actually, I think this was part of the diversion, this tunnel here. Hmm. And that's another photo from the upstream side of that. And so they, they expected to have to go through a whole winter, and so they accommodated how they might be able to get water around the dam during the construction season. Everybody's so thin in these photos. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is, of course, the clamshell type equipment that they were using at the time. And here's, here's some concrete going in, and very similar to the Hoover Dam, you know, they had to cool the concrete as they brought it up in lifts. Because this is what they consider mass concrete, which means that it heats up so warm that if you don't keep it cool, then it will begin to crack under the uh, process of uh, curing. And here's after the dam was, was installed, just beginning to fill it with water. Uh, and here's the last photo of reconstruction. So this was probably within a year after construction as the dam began to fill up with water. And I think it took a few years for the, for the dam to fill up. Um, as, you, as we'll look at, the hydrology in this area is very variable. And so some years, like you've probably seen over the last five years, we get hardly any runoff. Um, and then some years we get some pretty large storms. So I'm sure it was the same back then. So during construction, they realized that there was going to be a problem with the dam. Um, one of the engineers working on it identified that there was a problem with the aggregate they were using for the concrete. And uh, so to give you a little dose of engineering, when you have a problem with the aggregate, that one of the, one of the situations they call out is alkali silica reaction. And what that essentially is is that the, 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 the aggregate is not compatible with the cement. And it will uh, form a gel around each of the pieces of aggregate, which will essentially cause the internal pressure to push out. And then the concrete will lose strength, and it will begin to crack up. And here's a good photo of a wall. I don't know. That looks like a paw. I wonder if this is at a zoo or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's what, and, and I know we've all seen those from time to time. And, and uh, wondered what maybe what that the reason was for all that cracking up. So sometimes you see it, it, and in other places it looks concrete doesn't look like that at all. But that's what it's going on. What's going on? And you can see in this photo that the aggregate is actually fracturing, and the the, the crack is actually pushed out from the aggregate into the surrounding concrete. So along with that, and and realizing they realized early on that. That, that sediment would fill the reservoir up eventually. I think they had around a 40-year estimated time period that it would fill up. They, the engineers began to look at other alternatives for sources of water for the Ojai and Ventura areas. And, and that was really the beginning of, of the planning that went into the, the design construction of the Casitas Reservoir. And um, after Casitas Reservoir, was constructed, the municipal water district was created to manage that facility, and they actually took over management of the Matillaha Dam for uh, water conservation purposes. So because of this ASR problem, the dam's been uh, reduced in, in height a couple of times in the 60s and then in the 70s. So the original height was, was 198 feet, and now it's 168 feet. Um, and, um, uh, no information really to give, but DSOD is still concerned about the dam, and we're in regular conversations about them, about, about making sure that the dam stays safe, and they're very interested in the dam removal project. They would love to see the dam removed. They haven't put, taken a position that we have to remove it for safety, but um, without dam removal, there's no question that there will be more modifications to the dam in the future mm -hmm. uh, because of the strength that's lost in the concrete. So in the 1970s, there became a grassroots effort to remove the dam. That was obviously not part of the agency that I worked for, but, mm -hmm. but the community began to talk about, you know, what's really the need for this reservoir anymore, given some of the concerns that, that they, we have. And, um, and so that started going on uh, behind the scenes. And then in the, the mid nineties or so, uh, the group that Paul Jenkins works for, works with, Surfrider Foundation, um, developed a subgroup called the Matillaha Coalition. And um, 
their objective was was really to remove the dams to allow the sediment out to the ocean. It's their their primary focus is uh, general environmental issues, but certainly the health of of the ocean and our beaches. And they saw that the Matelaha Dam was was contributing to a problem at our beaches. So. Um, and of course, the second second issue with the dam is is the steelhead trout. In 1997, they were designated as endangered species, and uh, that was kind of a game changer for uh, well for for the whole Southern California area, really those that work in rivers. But but certainly in discussing until uh, dam removal, that just gave a, another really strong reason uh, to remove the dam. The uh, the Matillaha Dam and the Casillas Reservoir are really the, the major block just to habitat within the Ventura River watershed to steelhead. And in the Matillaha watershed, um, that, ha that contains about 50% of the, of the historic habitat for steelhead. And that's really for spawning and rearing because those areas upstream of the dam, they really do stay wet all summer long. Uh, if you get down, and, and there's no question there's been some uh, uh, modification to the system due to water purveyors and so on, but if you go down to Santa Ana Boulevard, uh, <coughs> those areas, you know, they dry up every spring. And so I think there was always discontinuity in the watershed between the ocean and the upper watershed. So these areas in the Matilla Hall watershed are very important for steelhead. And there's about 17 miles of uh, habitat that's currently blocked off. I, I'm not, Paul is, I'm not involved with, with fish surveys, but uh, my understanding is there are uh, landlocked um, steelhead or rainbow trout above the dam still that are part of that remnant population. And, and 5,000, that was the number we're talking about. So not huge, but I think by Southern California measures, it's a good population. So this is what it looked like in 1960, probably from very close to where Hanging Rock was. Uh, great place to put a boat out and enjoy. Uh, 1969 was a huge flood. Uh, we probably received about, well, not quite half now, but we used to say about half the sediment that was behind the dam came from that storm, about three million yards. So very flashy watershed, and 69, as we all know, that work in this industry was a uh, huge, huge flood year. Um, and, uh, and so the dam filled up. And here's what it looks like now. So, so when it was first built, it had about, uh, about uh, 7,000 acre feet. So acre feet, you know, a foot, a foot of water over an acre, 7,000 7, acre feet. Um, current storage is less than 400, and of course, Part of that is not only sediment, but also that the dam was notched. But not really much storage, and no, not much really, not not really any use for water supply any longer. Where's the beach? So that seven million now yards of sediment that's behind the dam. Well, clearly, if it hadn't been trapped by the reservoir, it would have gone down and and gotten out to the beach, and uh, some of that probably would have would have uh, you know, helped armor the beach and stabilize the beach. And this is where it would have gone. I know Paul has been very instrumental in working on a, uh, a project, a sort of a planned retreat of the, uh, uh, of the recreational trails there and put in dunes and different things. Um, and, and so this is certainly one area right outside you know, when you look at it, I don't know if any of you ever think about it, but, but you know, if you draw a line down the beach, it kind of comes this way, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of this material here really, really is, uh, is the, the fan of the river. And, and that, that is contributed by, the, the, or that comes out of the watershed and then obviously gets resorted by the ocean currents and waves. So without that regular replenishment of sediment, we're, we're gonna over time lose what now has become our fairgrounds and the existing estuary that's there. So very critical uh, issue and it's certainly related to the project. So in 1998, the county uh, 
got moving uh, and responded to the, the that upswelling of concern by by the, the people in the community and we worked with the Bureau of Reclamation to do an appraisal report. That appraisal report basically looked at some concepts on what how the dam could be removed and what the impacts of the dam removal would be. Uh, after uh, after that was done, we actually had a small project uh, to remove part of the concrete dam. It wasn't it wasn't an important amount of concrete from the standpoint of dam removal, but it was important from the standpoint of getting everybody together and celebrating the work that had been done by the bureau, and also kind of as a visioning exercise of you know this this is kind of the beginning or kickoff of what could be a, a long uh, a good dam removal project. So. Uh, Bruce Babbitt, who uh, uh, worked for, it was the head of the Department of Interior, um, came out and he actually got on the crane and kind of moved around one of these blocks for a few minutes. And it was a fun event that was involved with that. Um, subsequent to that, though, the district decided that the federal agency that really had the money was the Corps of Engineers. And, and the Corps of Engineers has a very large budget. So it, we, we actually worked on on a, on a feasibility study with them uh, that was ran for about 2001, 2004, and culminated in almost record time with an EIRIS and a feasibility study, um, and looked at various alternatives. You know, there were a lot of concerns about how to how to handle the sediment, discussions about trucking and the impacts to the community, which they were very against. Um, looking at um, some of the downstream concerns. Uh, this watershed has a lot of complexity to it, and studies uh, studies that I've seen about dam removals is that the more the more uh, stakeholders that you have in the watershed, the more complex the dam removal is, the more expensive it is, the more time it takes. So we've got development downstream with the Miners Oaks and Live Oak Acres, uh, Casitas Springs areas. We have water purveyors, Casitas. Uh, City of Ventura, we've got uh, some, some bridges that are down there, and uh, we are certainly have fish and other habitat that would, uh, uh, could be impacted by the dam removal. So, so this really falls in that category of very complex. So here's the reservoir sediment to give you an idea. Uh, and um, in case some of you haven't thought about it before, the way that the sediment comes in is, is if you have a reservoir area, the, the water that the sediment is carried in will hit that, that water and it will slow down the flow coming down the creek. And as it slows down the creek, the largest sediment will fall out and then it will move a little while longer and then that sediment will fall out. And finally, as the water is the slowest, uh, the finest sediment will, will fall out. So, what we see in the reservoir is what we would expect. You see some sorting of the heaviest gravel and cobbles up here, and then you've got sand, silt, and then down here toward the dam itself, you have the finest material. And uh, there's been, there was some testing done during the Corps of Engineers feasibility study, and that has also some high organics, which is uh, a concern for the downstream water purveyors. Here's what the Corps of Engineers study showed as the temporary storage areas, and these are largely the sediment, and it would all be processed at some level so that it wouldn't slump back into the creek, but these are the fine sediment areas and these are the coarse sediment areas, and basically they, part of the project would be carving a, um, a new creek down along a considered historic alignment of the creek. And here are all the, what we call mitigations, not, not in the compensatory mitigation language of those, if some of you are, are familiar with working with regulatory agencies, where if, if we go into a creek and we mess up some vegetation, we have to do mitigation by replanting vegetation. These are actually mitigations for what would happen, what, what uh, the dam removal would cause downstream. So, so due to, the release of sediment down the watershed, there's concerns that the river will come up in elevation and that will cause problems with some of the, the developed areas. And so we have uh, two levees, one at Miners Oaks, and the, or three levees, although one, Dan Casillas Springs is kind of dropped off. 
Miner's Oaks, Live Oak Acres, near Santa Ana Boulevard, and then Casita Springs. There's more refined analysis has shown that impacts don't go down that far. Um, also, we have two bridges. Camino Cielo is just downstream of the confluence with North Fork of Matillaha, and it's an Arizona crossing type of, of culvert. It's, I think the culvert may only be like four by eight. So it fills up a sediment now, actually. But after the dam removal, it would be overwhelmed. And so there's a, a proposal to put a new bridge there. And then, and then um, although originally it was talked about just putting an additional cell of the bridge in Santa Ana, we're looking at a full replacement there. Um, we also have impacts at the um, Robles diversion. So Robles has a diversion diverting flows down a canal into the reservoir. And so there's some improvements there to help pass some of that coarse sediment. Uh, there was talk of a desilting basin along the, along the canal, but I think that's fallen away uh, as a concern. And then, of course, the dam and uh, removal itself and the sediment associated with that, and then giant reed removal, which, although on the surface is not related to dam removal, the analysis they do to sh did to show that they had a, a net uh, cost benefit um, uh, that was acceptable. They actually had to improve the environment to a point where where fish and related frog and some of the other uh, uh, bird species were recovering. In order to do that, they really had to remove the rundo. So that became a part of the project, although not necessarily an impact of the dam removal. So here's a flyover. I don't know. Can we? Can I do that here? Something that was produced by the Corps. So it's uh, about 10 years old now. This is flying up the watershed, Ventura, Stanley Avenue there, and 33 Brooks Institute, which I guess this would be really dated when they moved to downtown. Uh, Foster Park. That Foster Park is where the wells are. Then there's the Casillas Levee. Um, we get into uh, what are the disposal areas for the sediment, I'll, and I'll describe that in a second. <coughs> Santa Ana Bridge, the levee at Live Oak Acres, additional disposal areas, and then um, Myers Oaks Levee, and then the high flow bypass to the Robles Diversion, and then ultimately up to the dam. So um, when they did the study in 04, finished in 04, the, the big concern was how do we deal with robust diversion? Because as, um, as is the case, uh, Casitas Reservoir is a, a major, um, uh, uh, they have all the, the water, water supply for Ojai and the Ventura area that's not groundwater related. So, so there was a lot of concern about making sure that the dam removal didn't cause any impacts to to the, the uh, diversion of water in the roadless. And, um, and so the concerns were not so much the coarse sediment, we th they think they can handle that, but it was the fine sediment, especially the organic material, because if the organic material were to get into the reservoir, then that would cause some algae blooms and some other, other um, issues that would make it very difficult for them to, uh, to, to get water and treat it effectively out of the reservoir. So in the, the Corps of Engineers plan, about a third of the sediment is actu was actually planned to be slurry downstream of Robles, and those disposal sites were shown as those areas that were considered for that purpose. So here's, here's sort of a showing you what it would look like with the hanging rock. I, I, <laughs> I don't, I'm not really sure it would look like this, because of course this, it looks like the sediment has mostly gone away, but which, which I don't think it will very quickly. But um, but this is something, and this is, I think this is something that something that Paul or one of, one of, somebody that he's worked with has created. But really, a vision for what it could look like after dam removal. So after the feasibility study was done, we embarked on a design process with the Corps of Engineers, and here is it makes up all the stakeholders and the groups that were involved. Um, it. Uh, it really, I'm just showing it to you just to get an idea of how many different stakeholders are involved in the project. It's very complex from the standpoint of 
getting everybody together and to agree on a way forward. And um, again, another, another way that this project is complex. So after we started design, it became clear that the cost of this slurring idea, this basically taking water, either, uh, either trapping it behind the dam or from Casitas, pumping it up to the reservoir, mixing it with the sediment behind the reservoir, and then, and then bringing it back down to these disposal areas was more expensive than it was originally uh, anticipated. Of, of the project that was estimated in the $145 million range, about $20 million was originally thought to be the cost of the slurry. And during the d final design phase, that doubled in price. So the Corps of Engineers began to think about, well, how can we bring that cost down? Uh, these BRDA, BRDA uh, sites, which were uh, really just an acronym for Baldwin Road, which is this road here, Baldwin Road disposal areas. So there were four sites. And although it wasn't shown as the preferred alternative, there, were, there was a site upstream in Miners Oaks that was looked at. And upon re-looking at that, it was thought that maybe that was a uh, good alternative. Uh, we took that out to the public and the stakeholders, and we got a lot of pushback. And uh, so the whole thing kind of unraveled from that standpoint. Um, that caused the Corps of Engineers to kind of go back to square one and say, well, what, how else can we handle the sediment? And we met with uh, Casitas and said, well, what, what, would, what, would you have, what would we have to do to make you feel comfortable with leaving that sediment up in the canyon? And their answer was, you'd have to sequester it so that it never gets out, so that none of that organic or fine sediment would ever get down to robust diversion. And so <coughs> the Corps and, their, and the engineers that worked with them uh, began to draw engineering drawings, which um, as you can guess from the stakeholder group that we have, were, were became a hard sell. So this is the, just a, a topographic a map of the area. This is what it would look like with the disposal areas. And these would be the, the three segments, the coarse material and the finer sediment would be upstream. So here's where the reservoir is now. And these areas would be up there. But what they were really showing the stakeholders was this which is uh, a really unattractive engineering drawing <laughs> of what somebody could think in their head. Of course, obviously it wouldn't look exactly like this, but, but the idea was to put some bank protection, some soil cement bank protection, which is a mixture of cement and aggregate, um, to protect this fine sediment from ever getting into the river and then overlaying it with some of the coarse sediment that's behind the dam. And, uh, and then the, the, the re restored river would then go in front of it. Uh, stakeholders did not like this. There was huge outcry. And, um, and that kind of put us in, again, kind of back to square one. So here's a little timeline of what happened. Uh, we looked at the Myers Oaks versus the Baldwin Road uh, uh, disposal areas and this dog, that's the design oversight group. We had a presentation where they told us they didn't like that. We then went back in 2010 with this upstream storage area, great acronym for the Corps of Engineers, USA. <laughs> um, stakeholders did not like that. And so the stakeholders asked to convene what they call the Fine Sediment Study Group. <coughs> In that group, we actually, uh, they actually pulled together a mediator to help kind of go through the issues. And they looked at the fine sediment and what, what the stakeholders wanted to see looked at. And out of that fine s sediment study group, they formed a technical advisory committee that with the task of creating some uh, scopes of work to be able to do some additional analysis and come up with some new ideas. And so it all took a, a, quite a while to do that with uh, getting everybody together on the phone or in person. And uh, finally, in February of 14, we, uh, after coming up with the scopes of work and, and uh, hiring a team of URS and Stillwater Sciences, we embarked on this contract in February of 14. So essentially, almost a six year period from the time that, that uh, we decided we didn't want to do the slurring downstream to even getting a contract in place. And that contract, uh, the Technical Advisory Committee delegated to about six of us to manage that consultant team. 
Again, it was URS, the project manager, Seth Gensler. Um, he was, uh, he's been the project manager for the San Clemente Dam removal project for the Coastal Conservancy and more recently for Cal American Water. I don't know if any of you know about that dam removal, but it's up near the San Clemente or near the, San, the Carmel area, California. And I think outside of, well, it, it is the largest dam removal in California that's been completed to date. There's a larger one up in the Northwest, but, um, and that, I just took a tour of that dam removal and that, that's, except for the vegetative restoration, that's uh, now done, it was done as of last fall. So, um, good stakeholder, a good group of people to work with on the um, management team of the contract. Uh, of course, the district, Casitas, uh, NOAA, we had an engineer from uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries, the California uh, Coastal Conservancy, a surf rider, and then the Bureau of Reclamation, who uh, did a lot of the sediment hydraulic work stemming back from uh, 2000. And here's a timeline of kind of what things were done. There were three scopes of work that we looked at. One was looking at possible different ways of removing the dam. One was looking at sediment analysis that would be, that would characterize those dam removal processes. And then the third was, given those alternatives and the consequences for sediment, how could we mitigate impacts to the Robles diversion and the water going down to Casillas Reservoir? And so, <clears throat> couple year process, we ended up with two large reports. One that talked about the alternatives and then sediment transport uh, related to that, and then a second that looked at the mitigations for Robles. And I'll talk about uh, those concepts now. So we had six initial options we looked at. Those were narrowed by the design oversight group down to three. And, um, and I'll show you what those look like. So here's the first alternative DRC1. Essentially, uh, essentially, uh, the consultant came up with a peak discharge of uh, 3,000 cubic feet per second in the river that they needed that large of a storm in order to send the sediment down the rivers of the ocean. So, um, but we needed to do it, these projects in a way that it didn't impact Robles until we, were, until we had that storm. So the idea would be building a, uh, drilling uh, a tunnel through the, the hill over the North Fork so that we could pass clean water until that storm occurred. Hmm. Uh, building this coffer dam which would keep the, the water for the smaller storms going down the tunnel. Uh, blasting the reservoir and it would, uh, you, you couldn't blast all of it but it would get quite a bit of it. And then, um, and then, and then a little small coffer dam which would basically keep any sediment that slumped and from the surrounding watershed from over coming in and leaking into the Matilla Creek. And so essentially, essentially you would do, uh, do, do drill the tunnel the first year and then, and then put in the coffer dam, the containment burn, and blast the dam in the second year. And then you'd wait for that nice big storm. And then when that would occur, you'd close the tunnel off and let it rip. So here's the tunnel. And um, as you saw from the construction photos, the geology has is, is got some very vertical planes. So, so it makes it a little bit more complex, but we need to drill into the uh, surrounding uh, rock in order to stabilize that tunnel. And this is the 35, 30 foot containment berm, or the, the uh, and then, and, and again, this would be made up of sediment this in the reservoir area that, that it would be designed to fail. So once we got that nice big storm, water would go up over and it would wash out the dam. And then here's the downstream berm that would also be washed out from that large storm. After that initial flush, then we'd go in and dig out the remainder of the dam and try to pick up any pieces that still were scattered around and kind of and clean it up and restore the area. So um, we looked at the hydraulics of this and, and uh, uh, some of the concerns were would the remaining sediment get washed away and essentially the good news would be that, that the water would really funnel into this deeper, narrow area and wouldn't be a problem. 
uh, from a, a vegetative standpoint because uh, a lot of the sediment would stay this would evolve into more of a case coastal scrub area and be a narrower riparian zone than it was historically um, and the cost we were looking at for this was about 40 million and you can see that we've, we've got two years of construction a waiting period for that storm and then clean up at the end for about a three to six year duration second alternative was drilling a couple of holes in the dam 12 foot diameter holes and what that would look like is basically through drilling and blasting creating cutting two two 12 foot diameter holes in the dam all the way upstream to the upstream four feet of the dam and so the the bottom of the dam is about 35 feet thick so cutting in about 31 feet and then drilling holes that are ready to be charged when that when that big storm comes in and when we forecast that big storm charge the holes blast them and then the sediment would evacuate um, kind of like going down uh, going down your toilet I guess. Uh, so uh, what that would look like uh, would be essentially drilling these two holes and being ready waiting for that big storm charging the holes letting the sediment go and then coming back and removing the dam and um, and then restoring the site and, and one of the benefits of this alternative is that if the estimates of sediment evacuation that that were uh, analyzed by the engineers didn't take place then we could put in some gates and wait for a second flush now as you can as you'll be able to see those that has impacts above and beyond what was estimated for the original alternative but that is a possibility to uh, and from the adaptive management standpoint that might be a positive so again hydraulics very similar to um, the DRC one and vegetation as well very similar this project this alternative is the cheapest one at less than 20 million and so as I said one year of construction to drill the holes a wait period and then and then a sediment flush uh, if we decided to add gates then it would it would increase that to a three to nine year period so all of a sudden it makes by adding gates you make and waiting for that second flush you, you add a lot of uh, duration to the project and there's some additional costs a couple more million to add the gates so here's the third alternative this alternative different than the, the first two takes this fine sediment that's high organic material and actually stockpiles upstream and is the most similar to the Corps of Engineers uh, concept. Um, these are, here's a picture of some work at San Clemente which gave credence to the possibility of being able to, to do this work. Essentially they have to put down, course aggregate down for an access road as they remove the material and then, and then they peel that up and, and, and lower it and then sort of flip flop the road back and forth as they work their way down because the material is very very soft here's some more pictures of San Clemente not without risk <laughs> so this alternative would be much different in the sense that you get all that fine sediment that we, you would whisk out and the other two alternatives out of the way before the project even uh, has any water wash over it. Um, and here, here are the stockpile areas again. So from a habitat standpoint, um, one problem with this alternative is that this area that is really riparian or ripe upland sort of fringed riparian now becomes upland and, and that was a concern to the stakeholders. And that's also at 50 million the most expensive alternative. So, in order to evaluate these alternatives, we did some technical assessments. We looked at the impacts to vegetation communities, uh, what the erosion and transport of sediment would look like, steelhead out, and then what the waiting period would look like before we could get steelhead moving back upstream. So, we used some some GIS data that we had. Uh, that was actually used during the IRIS, and we had some updated um, 
vegetation mapping as well. And they use these categories of, to, to do the vegetation mapping comparisons. And uh, we looked at basically the areas of impact and compared those to sort of before and after quantities. They also looked at sediment transport. And this is what, um, so this is what's going on right now with fine sediment. We've got uh, average of 55,000 cubic yards of fine sediment still being trapped behind the dam. And of course, the dam will eventually fill up and that won't happen anymore. About 280,000 cubic yards per year is moving downstream. So I don't know what that is, five times more? Five, five, times, five times more fine sediment is washing over the dam. It's getting trapped by the dam. So most of the sediment is going downstream. And then, uh, and then, of course, it's just the aggregate. The first year after the first two alternatives, we would have this much fine sediment estimated to go down in the big flush. So about three times the, the average of, of a normal year would go down from that. Whereas, um, whereas of the eroded volume from alternative three, because it's stockpiled upstream, most of that would, because it's been because it is stabilized wouldn't wash down and we also looked at at what what the sediment was doing as far as in suspension and uh, they looked at how much sediment was in suspension over a period of about 15 years and they uh, the consultant determined that that the uh, 10 of the fourth was really a very infrequent scenario of having sediment, but that 10 to the third was pretty standard. You know, we got all these events between these two bands over a 15 year period. So the river is used to having a pretty high sediment load when it, when it, uh, when it floods. And they used this information to compare to a couple other dam removals. If uh, a couple recent dam removals that have happened in the last 10 years, the Condon Dam, um, it's uh, actually not a good fit for, uh, for Matillaha because it's, it's mostly silt and clay. And then the Marmot Dam, which is more similar to, uh, to Matillaha. And they use these two examples to really bracket uh, what, the, what, what the, the amount of time that would be impacted by the sediment washing downstream. And what they found was, was that elevated sediment concentrations over 10 to the 4th were about a week with Condit and about 12 hours for moment. So what they were selling to the stakeholders that included the water purveyors was that your impact from the dam removal, you know, is probably going to be on the order of, of, of days. It may be the order of week, a week, but on the outside, maybe two weeks. And that was the, um, that was the message that they were delivering was that this is not a long term problem in the watershed. It's a short-term problem. This is what the erosion would essentially look like. Um, so the sediment would uh, first, be, first begin to erode down, and then it would find the old historic uh, uh, river area, and then these areas that had deposited previously would just slump down. And for all intents and purposes, really Revegetate and stabilize and stay in place for for the long term. So one of the things we looked at was steelhead health, and they used this Newcomb and Jensen severity score to create um, this graphic. And essentially, what these are is they looked at different mortality rates. So so we've got on. On the y-axis, total suspended sediment, milligrams per liter, and then duration. So essentially, if you're in this orange line of 20 to 40% mortality, if you can, you can have a higher, uh, be exposed to a higher suspended sediment for a short period of time, but as, if you're exposed to a longer period of time, it has to be a lower one for that category. So they use this really to compare what would happen after dam removal to what we have today. And uh, unfortunately, what we have today is a very treacherous environment. This is, this is the amount of suspended sediment that we have at different events that they looked at over the last 15 years. 
So this environment that the Matillaha Creek and Ventura River have is a pretty treacherous one for fish. Some of the biologists have said, well, you know, maybe they still have, have adapted to our watershed and maybe, you know, these kind of studies that might have been done in the Northwest or even in the Bay Area don't apply to us. But this gives you an idea that these fish have to be opportunistic. You know, they gotta go find refuge during these storms. They've gotta go look at subwater sheds where they can kind of get out of the way of some of this heavy sediment. And for uh, this initial flush, this one one day to a week, it would be it would be in this range. So it would be high high mortality in the watershed, and then. And then after that one day or a week, it would be down in the area that was experienced historically. We also looked at how long we need to wait for that large event to flush the sediment. And these are all the events uh, since 1925. So the median is waiting about two years, but it could be as much, it could be as soon as the next year after we uh, set the table for the dam removal, but it could be a lot longer than that. So. It's hard to say, we, I think we've had one 10 year period uh, over, uh, we've had one 10 year period, I think it was in the 40s, that it was quite low, this area right here. Um, but um, that that's part, would be part of any of the alternatives, I guess at least the first two. The third alternative, you would need to wait, although fish passage is not guaranteed until after that major storm. So uh, we looked at various evaluation criteria, uh, the steelhead passage, health, ecological health, and that's uh, sort of before or after uh, a uh, order of magnitude cost, looking at risk, and then finally looking at impacts to water supply from the removal. So from the um, steelhead passage, here are the durations that didn't seem to really come out unless we end up putting the gates in to be too different between the three alternatives. We also looked at the mortality of fish. The, uh, the first two alternatives were pretty much the same. If the fish couldn't find a way to get out of the way, then, then they would be lost. Um, one of the ideas that we looked at early on was uh, what they call progressive notching, which essentially is removing the dam in small chunks at a time. That's attractive from the standpoint of being able to fund a project because maybe you can get three, four, five million a shot. The problem with that is that every time you notch it, you have this same, this this same flush of sediment, and so you're not just you're not just killing that one that one year of, of fish species. You're killing every time you notch it, and so that that idea was thrown out very early in the process, but. Um, and of course we have other watersheds like the North Fork and San Antonio Creek that also have habitat. So surprising to me, the regulatory agencies, NOAA Fisheries and California Department of Fish and Wildlife are actually pretty okay with that single event impact. So habitat, um, the biggest impact was the third alternative because we had to stockpile a lot of material. And then, although these numbers look the same, take home is that um, the, uh, the riparian woodland goes way down for the third alternative, and then the uh, mixed chaparral goes way up. So basically, we're transferring by stockpiling sediment to a different habitat. And here's the cost. So clearly, alternative two is the cheapest. Uh, than any of the alternatives with even adding gates being quite cheaper than alternatives one and three. So we looked at different risk factors, I won't run through them, but looking at what concerns would be during construction, during the flushing period, and then after that. And then uh, looked at ranking the, the projects. We also looked at water supply and um, if if we're in a it's 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 if we're in a wet cycle of, of rainfall, <laughs> our project has no effect whatsoever because the year or two after dam removal and the dam fills up again. If we go if we're in a dry period like we're in now, and right now 
uh, Casillas is at about 40 percent. I'm not proposing that we <coughs> remove the dam under these conditions, <laughs> but even if the dam were say at 75 or 80 percent full, and then we were removing the dam and we we're in a dry period, the expectation is we would lose about four to six percent of the lake storage from that single impact. And uh, and the outcome of all these different criteria are that alternative two is the highest rank, and then alternative two B and three are the second rank, and alternative one was the worst rank. So uh, in a nutshell, alternative two is the lowest cost risk and impact to vegetation. Um, alternative three is the highest impact to vegetation and the highest uh, highest cost, but um, it, it does have a lower impact to fish and to water supply. No one seemed to like alternative one. Had a relatively high cost, but also there was a lot of concern about pushing the water to the North Fork. They thought that you know, if, if this is the place where we're going to tell the fish that they can go, then we shouldn't be do impacting that remaining uh, habitat. So that was a concern. So after we did that first study that was made up of two scopes of work, we looked at um, different um, ways that we could, we, could, we could mitigate for those impacts to the water supply purveyors. And the two suppliers are Casitas and the city of Ventura. Uh, Casitas into their reservoir, and then Ventura, they divert near Foster Park through a, a subsurface or near surface intakes. And here are all the groundwater basins. There's no question that groundwater is a major player in water supply. It's not just all surface water, but, um, and that gives us perhaps some ability to be able to look at different ways of, ha of mitigating by these different types of sources of, of groundwater or of water. And here's the concern, kind of in a sci science sort of graphic, sun coming down, causing all this algae bloom from this, uh, uh, you know, from, from the organics that might come down from the reservoir area and get diverted into casitas. So they looked at 23 different options and in the categories of replacing the diversion and those were things like diverting water above the dam through the hill into the reservoir and uh, also uh, replacement supplies. So that might be um, actually uh, piping water from uh, Castaic over to, uh, over to Casitas to be able to move state water project water all the way over to Casitas. Uh, looking at reuse and conservation. And so certainly conservation has been a big topic through the drought and felt, people felt like that was a good, a good one to look at for the replacement. And they also looked at treatment alternatives within the reservoir operations. So here they all are. Um, some of them were quite expensive, like uh, uh, you know, diverting water from uh, Matillaha to North Fork, Matillaha, and then to the Canal. Uh, infiltration galleries, which essentially are pipes underneath the river to replace the existing diversion that, that Casitas has. That was very expensive and had a lot of environmental impact. So we looked at these alternatives, which were essentially um, replacing um, some surface water casitas with some groundwater in the mound basin. We looked at um, putting in some new wells in the Santa Paula Basin, uh, which is on the east side of Ventura, and then uh, also enhancing the wells at Foster Park. Um, we also looked at something a little interesting, the idea of crop idling. So uh, as some of you know, that been to Ojai, there's a lot of um, citrus groves, so if we were ready to remove the dam, we might say, well, uh, uh, could we buy your rights to plant your land for 10 years or something like that? Uh, it wouldn't be cheap, but it would be a way to, to, to lower the amount of usage in the Ojai Valley. Um, and then the, we also looked at various <coughs> improvements to Casitas' um, operations. I can say that there was a lot of interest by the stakeholders about these ideas. They weren't real happy about 
things like adding new wells near Foster Park. They weren't interested in, in doing anything that would be new sources of water. They felt very concerned about that, and there's uh, big concerns about extracting water from the river uh, due to fish habitat already. So they were very interested in the, in the conservation type uh, of uh, alternatives. But the way that we sort of left it was that, well, really, these are contingency plans. Because if we're in a wet cycle, we might not need to do any of this. So if we remove, remove the dam, and then the next year the dam fills up and almost spills, well, we're done, right? So, so these, these, this study, which I got to say, I think everybody thought it would become a bigger part of the, uh, of the analysis really became, everybody really wanted to sort of put it off to the side and say, well, let's go ahead and use that for an adaptive management scenario where the dam is removed and we go into a dry cycle, and we'll pull that out, dust it off, and figure out how to fund some of these ideas. But they, they, didn't, they didn't want to talk about actually constructing some of these ideas from the get-go. So, that study just ended this last winter, and then we had a recent design oversight group meeting to ask the group which alternative they like to choose. And as silly as it is, we, we had them put dots on a, on, a, on the poster board. Uh, the yellow dots are their second choice. The green dots were their first choice. So alternative one got a few second choices. Alternative three got one first choice and one second choice. And alternative two was the winner. Um, Interesting, um, some of the stakeholders actually took the L dot and put it in their pocket. <laughs> they did not want to vote on a second alternative. They were so, uh, it was so important that, that this alternative too was the top choice, they didn't even want to muddy the discussion. So a second uh, part of that discussion we had on March 17th was, is this still a federal project or is this now a local project? And uh, Sam Jenikas of the Coastal Conservancy presented this graphic. Actually, he presented for all three alternatives, but this is relevant to alternative two. If we did a local project, it would be relatively simple. You know, we would uh, identify the funding, we'd go through final design of the dam removal and downstream components, we'd do sequinipa, identify the funding for construction, then put the project. But if we wanted to stay with the core, They've already gone through and told us that this did not look like the federally authorized project. So we go through and we'd ask them to look at alternative two. If, uh, if it does look like the congressionally authorized project, then they would, um, they would ask for a construction start and then we'd enter an agreement and then they evaluate, do a, what they call an evaluation or a limited reevaluation of that alternative two and then we implement the project. But if they said no, didn't look like the authorized project, then we basically have to get reauthorization and start from square one with the Corps. So uh, we had somebody from the Corps of Engineers there. They were very concerned about us just punting um, a federally authorized project um, out and just from the get-go, but uh, it seemed as though the stakeholders in general and there was somebody from NOAA Fisheries, uh, Stacy <coughs> Smith, stood up and said, if we get the right alternative, the funding will show up. So they were much less worried about it fitting within the federal project than they were about getting the alternative that they really wanted. And so we haven't closed the door on the Corps of Engineers federally, federal project, but the alternative two does not look like the federal project. So the next steps, are looking for the funding, and, and um, uh, a gentleman from Patagonia, Hans Cole, who is the, uh, he's the uh, term or environmental advocacy manager for Patagonia. Uh, sounds like a title someone just made up, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, he's the guy that coordinates any environmental issues that, that Patagonia is concerned about and wants to work through. He actually volunteered to be the chair of the funding subcommittee, so we're setting up a committee made up of all the regulatory <laughs> agencies, which in some cases also possibly have funding available. And uh, Coastal Conservancy, the district, which is who I'm with, and then um, Surf Rider, 
and uh, we're meeting for our f the first time on Monday, and we're going to be looking at where the funding would come for, from for this chosen alternative two, and uh, that's really the first step. Once we come up with what we think is a credible funding plan, uh, then then I guess we have a decision to make on whether or not it's a federal project or a local project. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussions about whether it is or isn't within that group. But So that's where we are today. It's been a long haul so far. Uh, one, one thing that's going on locally, some of you may heard about if, you, uh, if you've got a mailer in your uh, mailbox, but uh, Ventura County Transportation Commission is actually looking at possibly a half cent sales tax this November. On the ballot, um, they have identified over a 30-year period, so it's not a short time, about 200, 200 to 240 million for environmental enhancement or um, um, you know uh, land purchasers. And uh, this project, I guess, we met with them and they thought that this would probably fit within that. So where we didn't see we had local funding three months ago. It's possible if that were to pass that there would be a source of funding that we might be able to tap into. The problem with going local is that is that the state or federal agencies that might have grant programs that we could tap into oftentimes have cost share they require. So so say I go for a grant for six million dollars and I need a three million dollar cost share, well then I've got to come up that three million and I can tell you that that it, there's not three million <laughs> in any year, it would be multiple years to get three million in cost shares. So we have to look creatively on how to how to find local funding in order to even be able to match with some of the state and federal funding grants that might come up. So, um, so that's what I got. Questions. So it's great to see how much progress has been made and, and do you think it was really important to see the behavior of the sediment and the rap rapidity that like the Sandy River and the Condit Dam removal, how they dealt with the sediment? Because that seemed to be, yeah. like, people were surprised at how quickly those, flush those flushing events happened. Yeah, no there's no question that, that, uh, uh, that dam removal that occurred in the last 10 years have really informed the community of uh, scientists that work on dam removal uh, tremendously. And that helps a lot because uh, without that, uh, you're not really not, you're, you're, your bracket is a lot broader, <laughs> you know. And when you talk about risk or uncertainty, it, it's, it has to be way out here because we don't really know how it's gonna happen. But uh, they've actually, not only those two, but they actually looked at uh, tailing dam failings. So, that's certainly not for environmental benefit, mm -hmm. but we, we all know that from time to time, um, mine operators will, their, their tailings uh, dams will fail, and they've studied those too, and, and frankly, those have the similar behavior as a dam removal, and so they've been able to take that information and use it, and I, I think that makes this analysis more credible. Yeah, sure. to have it as an acute event rather than something right. that's happening. Right, the right. And, time. and the fact that we can do some forecasting instead of just kind of yeah. You know, well, maybe it's going to happen like this. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. I'm so happy to see that this is so thorough. I, I, I had no idea that this much attention to detail has been put into this project. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool to see. Um, I had a general question, sort of things that each of these stakeholders may have had. Are there things that each of the stakeholders may have had interest in, but it was just too small for not necessarily within the scope of the of the project to pursue that maybe somebody like a lowly undergrad student could do research on. Is there is there something um, that you know we we interested? actually we actually had somebody um, that had called from some university back east that wanted to do some work and, and they were going to use some of the online resources uh, GIS information, but. Um, there's been some work done on it. We've done some work and spent some money, but the uh, the Arundo we've we've re actually removed the giant reed, the Arundo Donax, mm -hmm. from Highway 150 upstream into the canyon, mm -hmm. and we're we're doing retreatments. It's it's tough to kill. Uh, <laughs> like, you just keep on knocking it down. You actually don't kill it. But uh, I hope we're making some progress. But um, 
Uh, and we've, we've done some photo documentation of how the natives have come back. None of those areas have been replanted. They've all been native recruitments. But uh, I would say from an environmental standpoint, and until the dam's removed, which I think we'll have, there'll be a lot of things to study about. But, but there's been a lot of giant reed removed in various watersheds in the, uh, in the county. And uh, I would think there might be some things that could be done with that. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at, uh, you, know, you know, habitat changes, mm -hmm. uh, transformations uh, to different types of habitat. And we were talking beforehand uh, about some work that's been done uh, at some preserves downstream of 150 right now, and how how all the all the green is above 20 feet high because the rundo that was removed below it re removed all that. And so, what and and believe me, as an engineer, I can only talk and be dangerous with this information, but. Um, <laughs> But you know all the understory vegetation that you normally see in riparian areas that's not there because the rundown's been there. It'll be interesting to see how that how that recovers. With, with respect to the gate, so alternative two, are they opening that up? Are they looking at turbidity currents moving through, being more more dense, or? Well, I I didn't get into it, but one of the things that they put into the alternative is actually putting in some tunnel or some <coughs> barrel pipes. Mm -hmm. So they're, I don't know how big they would be, like you know, four or six feet. So the problem is, the pro one of the problems with that alternative is, and people have brought up, is it, are you gonna get, are, is the organic material that might have fallen into the reservoir that's still buried, is that gonna get caught mm -hmm. in, in the hole? And, um, they, they think they think it's not because they've the I don't know if it was continent marmot but it was done very similarly and they didn't have any problems there, mm -hmm. but um, uh, but these essentially these these pipes are going to allow water to go straight down in front of the holes so so until that initial what they call phase one lowering of the reservoir occurs mm -hmm. then water will be able to go straight in that hole and essentially churn up the water. In front of the, um, the sediments, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so in that regard, and, and it could happen. There's mm -hmm. no question, but they, they don't think that it will. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to be to hog the floor, but a burning question about. So I'm a fish biologist. I'm really interested in. Hadn't really thought about that. The fish that are upstream of this dam are potentially like this reservoir sure. population, yeah. right? That's really important in terms of the restoring the Southern California. Still right. population. So are people looking at like what is the genetic complement of that population and how many of them are? No so idea. That would be a good one to ask Paul. He might know. But yeah, I don't know. And I, I, I wouldn't bet money that there hasn't been planting up there since the dam went in. So mm -hmm. it may, I'm not sure if how, how, what if, what of that is actually original native. Yeah, what are hatchery. You know, I when I was a kid, uh, Long, long time ago now. We used to go to, um, oh, what's the campground up North Fork? Uh, we, we, Wheeler Gorge. We used to mm -hmm. fish in Wheeler Gorge. And they used to drop, they used to, to plant by, by uh, I don't know if it was helicopter or airplane, mm -hmm. they drop them huh. into the creek. Um, but, um, and they stopped that since then. Uh, a lot of areas in the county where they used to plant um, nat native creeks they've stopped doing that but so I'm not sure what what the but that'd be great to know before you know before this project goes ahead like what proportion of that population yeah. might be native well it's a yeah. good population and uh, diversion right, right now there is I mean I've seen video of that oh there have been it's yeah they've they've had a few probably a few dozen I mean that's only been in place well that 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 was <coughs> completed after 05 which is the last really significant year of rainfall but They've had some fish, but that's another area where it does it does dry up in the spring. And so if they don't get if they don't find some place in the North Fork, they probably aren't going to go over anywhere. Yeah. You talk about a small attenuation to Casitas, right? Uh, in, in terms of capacity under one of your scenarios, was that? What's, what's that now? I thought you talked about a small attenuation in the capacity of Casitas. Yeah. Like oh yeah, yeah, 
percent. Saying, the loss of the loss of diversion. So is that is that yeah. is that because sediment's going into Casitas, or is that because the channel is well when when channel? you get that flush of fine sediment, they're not going to divert. So. Oh, so it's, when, it's, it's that that many days that or many weeks. Days, right, oh, oh, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. of diversion. I got gotcha. you. They used to say when they, the core project was happening in the early two thousands that about half of the water from Casitas came from um, Ventura River. Um, I'm not sure that they were sharing this their data at that time, but mm -hmm. the work that Stillwater uh, I did with URS looked at their analysis and they actually showed that it's only about thirty percent of the water that gets in the reservoir is from Ventura. The other 70% is water that falls on the reservoir or comes down the Coyote Creek catchment. So it's not an insignificant mm. amount of water that they divert, but it's not as mm. critical for a short impact as once was thought. And then uh, another unrelated question, <clears throat> um, just so I have it correct in my head. so. This was a unique situation in that the voters of Ventura voted to pay for their own dam and, and do their own dam. So the core has been involved simply because it has the word dam on it? Yes. And that, that and by has, courtesy? That has been one of the issues with uh, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. They're the ones that have to kind of give their uh, sort of civics mm -hmm. lesson here. Mm -hmm. They have to give their A-OK -okay for it to get into the budget uh, and they've been they've been holding it up and it, it initially it was I think they thought there there weren't going to be able to get fish past Casitas diversion and, but even if once once they were convinced that, that they could uh, they sort of said well you know this isn't a federal dam mm -hmm. so where's the nexus for a federal project the core the Corps of engineers has sort of a three-legged stool for their authorizations uh, Flood control, net navigation, and environmental. Environmental, um, I shouldn't say this on tape, but <laughs> that's not been funded as well as the other right, two. Right, sure, right. So, um, so, so even though we've been kind of ready and waiting, uh, they just, you know, with uh, her, you know, the Superstorm Standy and the mm -hmm, flooding mm -hmm. in the Dakotas, and you know, every year it seems to be one new, some one new emergency. That takes precedent over everything, right? Everything else. So uh, we haven't seen any federal funding since '09. So it's it's courtesy, basically. It's professional courtesy and collaboration, but it's well, not not a mandatory. Yeah, on their yeah, on they, their side. Right. No, I mean they're well. They're they're never. It was never mandatory. Um, when you have a project, and you ask the court, come and look at our project and tell us if you have interest in the project, then they do an evaluation of economics. Whether it's a national significance, and then and then and then they have to write all these reports and get all these signatures, and and it goes all the way to, to Washington to be approved, and then Congress uh, has to then actually authorize mm -hmm. that you can you can move forward with this project. So there are there certainly are some national significance, especially environmental, uh, that they are involved with that. Um, you know, that aren't related to flood control or navigation. Those previous two dams were, the, were, the, were those core projects? Marmot, Marmot and Condit were not federal right. projects. I don't think that they, and neither San Clemente. Because they got done. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> the, the, one, the one in the, uh, near, the near Seattle, the Elwha Dam, that's a uh, park service dam. Huh. Um, but uh, I think that one is the only federal one that I'm aware of. Okay. Large dam. If you talk to people about dam removals on the East Coast, they're talking about the removal yeah. of things like <laughs> right. this. Yeah. Much different than our dam removals. I'm just curious why this wasn't designed as a bottom release dam in the first place. Oh, you, you, mean, you, you mean like the three, three, three Gorges does where they flush the sediment? I don't know that anybody thought of it in those mm -hmm. days. But frankly, with the, with the, the ASR, the, the alkali silica reaction, We'd still be, because believe me, there have been, and when you get into the groups of people that are really uh, interested in the dam being removed, and you get some guy, you know, make it bigger, <laughs> you know, you, you're always going to get one in a crowd, <laughs> completely the opposite of the rest of the crowd, um, you know, because clearly, you know, there's some concerns about water supply locally, and 
there are some that really want to see enhanced storage, even in the Ventura County. You know, Ojai doesn't get any state water project. Yeah. Really. Yeah, it's so amazing. They're completely independent. Yeah. So uh, real <coughs> dicey. You know, we we actually um, just uh, somebody that we were talking about before this the. the uh, the meeting, Elizabeth Mark Martinez and I have been working on a diversion up in San Antonio. Um, very complicated, fish screens, um, only can divert when the flow is above a foot downstream. But, you know, they're, they're, are, they're looking at different ways of capturing the storm water where they can. But, um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so that just makes casitas even that much more critical. You can't, you can't put all these people out of water. Uh, you know, we fortunately we haven't been in as bad a shape as some of the folks in Central Valley that have had to, been, to have truck their water in. But um, you guys are confident that, that the integrity of that dam can withstand these large holes earthquakes? No, the holes. Mm -hmm. up? Well, that there hasn't been a lot of analysis, but the engineers, <laughs> yeah. the engineers working on it say that it looks good. Um, uh, DSOD, we've talked to Division of Safety of Dams, which is the state agency that is is in place to look at large dams and make sure that they don't fail. Uh, and uh, uh, they are concerned about both alternatives one and two. Alternative three, I think they're pretty okay with as long as we can show the slopes of the stockpile uh, being stable. But um, I, I actually, in the back of my mind, wonder if we were to push alternative two with them, they might say, well, why don't you just put the gates on from the get-go, mm -hmm. and then you can use that opportunity to do some work on the dam mm -hmm. to strengthen it. Um, it's you know it's another two million dollars or whatever, but um, that you know in the the Arnold Schwarzenegger world, <laughs> charging the reservoir and blowing up those holes sounds like a great idea, but for state <laughs> agency, it sounds a little dicey, and there's some concern that. You know, if, could you, um, you know, if you, it's so hard to forecast floods. Even two days out, you really don't know. Uh, so could you charge these things and be ready to blow them and then, you know, and then the, the storm blows into LA or something. So, um, so alternative two, you know, may end up, end up with gates and they may, it would be more expensive because we need to dewater the reservoir and pull the sediment off the front of the dam and then install them. But, um, but that could be done, I think, too. Yeah. Um, in terms of the longitudinal profile, uh, do they have any idea of how long it would take for that to stabilize where it should be? Um, Since you're I don't know. Have a profile you, like this now. Well, well, they they indicated. I mean, if you're asking about fish passage, they're indicating that fish passage. Will will be able, fish will be able to pass through the reservoir area after that first flush. Well, I was thinking more in just terms of the geomorphology and the equilibrium yeah. profile. Uh, 